It all began with a human craving. What is this place? Being scared in a controlled environment is a safe way to face death and then to go home and become boring again. What's going on in this town? It's part of just human nature, to the liking to, to be scared. <laughs> Knowing that things are going to be OK, it's, it's like going on a roller coaster. <laughs> but the early attempts were far from frightening. There were a lot of games that, you know, they tried to be scary in the old days, and they just couldn't do it. And technology's footsteps slowly started catching up. It's just fun to be a, a mask guy with a chainsaw and, and hack some stuff up. I didn't want to play it before I was going to bed because I knew that I'd be lying in bed going, oh god, what was that noise? And the debate continues over the gruesome content. Do I think gore is necessary? Well, having never been bitten by a zombie myself, I don't know how much blood would squirt out of my arm. This is a personal thing. I don't think there's any element that should ever be taboo. Ultimately, designing scary games comes down to one very important thing. The thing that we're going after is real fear. I feel like I'm dreaming. Like you would have experienced in your worst nightmares. More like a nightmare, I'd say. Some psychologists say that when humans are threatened, they experience an increase in strength, power, and even intuition. This is commonly known as an adrenaline rush. And what better place to experience this than sitting face to face with your favorite scary video games? I think people like anything that sort of gets at their emotions. From a basic feeling, I think it's to just like to get scared and have a little bit of a rush. Being scared in a controlled environment is a safe way to face death and then to go home and become boring again. My dime store psychology degree makes me think that maybe because it makes us feel alive. It's part of just human nature, to the liking to be scared, knowing that things are going to be OK. It's, it's like going on a roller coaster. Creating a video game that actually scares somebody is much more difficult than one may expect. Turn down the lights, lock your door, and look around. Because Haunted House is about to find its way in. That was actually Atari 2600. Holy smokes, that was like the adventure one almost, where they had the little boxes and the little squares. In the early 80s game Haunted House, you as a set of eyes are trapped in a dark maze, hunting for the pieces of a magical urn, all the while trying to avoid a painful death from tarantulas, vampire bats, and even ghosts. Used to be, I mean, the environment was literally a square box, you know, in one color. And that's not scary. Not quite terrifying. Uh, maybe the only way that you thought you had to die and you had to restart way back in the beginning. That'd probably be the most scariest part in it. <laughs> but as time progresses, so does the new genre, as new games like Chiller begin creeping up on us. They all sort of stood out as games that weren't scary back in the day. They couldn't get at your emotions. I think the original developer's intent for a lot of the titles is just to make the game how they want to make it. And then think of a horror element afterward. They tried to be scary in the old days, and they just couldn't do it. Like the zombie bashing Splatterhouse. I loved it for its time, but it wasn't because it was scary. It was just fun to be a, a masked guy with a chainsaw and, and hack some stuff up, right? Total rip off of Friday the 13th, total rip off of horror films, and consequently, an awful, awful game. Until the technology got us to a point where you could have very detailed backgrounds and character models, very detailed sound, these things just weren't going to be scary. It was either you really extremely had a horror title, or it was just an action adventure game that had a lot of shooting and cutting and slicing and blood and all this, and you were trying to make it a horror game. Yet in spite of the primitive technology, Castlevania is released in 1987, and the masses eat it up. If that was done today, you know, fully updated, it probably would have been incredibly scary. But back in the day, I mean, you're dealing with, you know, 16 colors of graphics, sound that, you know, is basically what you can create on your telephone keypad. How can you create scariness without it? So it doesn't exactly have you grasping onto your controller, but it does prove that horror can scare up big profits. 
and in 1992. The hair-raising genre creeps into our computers when the HP Lovecraft-inspired Alone in the Dark is released by Infogroms for the PC. I remember going over to a friend's house to play that because, you know, it was one of those like, oh, you gotta come see this game. And you add in creaking doors, the wind and the sort of ominous soundtrack below that. And I think, you know, what that does is it creates an environment where you actually care about what happens inside of it. That was a brand new uh, experience for the gamer. It had zombies, it was in 3D, it had cool sound. I, I turned off the lights and I had to take a break from time to time because I started getting creeped out. I'd never had an experience like that in gaming. Beyond the blood splattering and spooky sounds, the game had a niche. This game was clearly difficult to play. The puzzle system that was implemented in the game was real hard. Unless you had like two or three hours to really sit down and play it, you weren't going to get very far. You know, it wasn't the kind of thing like, hey, dude, come play this game. And, you know, it just didn't work that way. And the so-called adrenaline rush comes knocking on our doors. And then they had moments where crap would dump out of the windows at you, right? And you're just like, oh, you know, I've never seen that in a game before. So you'd be like, I'm in trouble here. So it was good. The sales are respectable, but the impression is unforgettable. And the video game industry has a brand new genre that's bound to give you chills. Boo. Alone in the Dark gets the credit for starting the genre. By the early 1990s, the horror genre is slowly making an impact, and gamers across the world are beginning to get spooked. In 1993, CD-ROM games storm the industry and take seventh guest with it. The haunting and taunting puzzle game where ghosts make frequent appearances. It was almost like an adventure style horror game. In the morning. It was kind of new for its time. You had some good voices. Every wish grant. Some really good kind of ghostly animations and a fairly decent engrossing story. Much Copycats and sequels like Phantasmagoria and The Eleventh Hour are appearing around every corner, and almost all are gruesomely bad. I think Seventh Guest was a, a better title. They tried to do more of the same, and it just felt very kind of strained. The full motion video CD-ROM craze seems to be meeting an early death. FMV, I think, is perhaps the worst thing to ever happen in this business. And in fact, I mean, a lot of people look back and if they want to say now why are companies like Sega and 3DO in such bad shape, it's because they really hitched their wagon to that. As thinking that was going to be the future, that's what was going to set them apart. Alone in the Dark gets a sequel in 1994 and another in 1995, both for the PC. We really took a lot of time to make sure it was more about the vibe than about the gore. And that's about setting the mood, getting the right kind of uh, sounds, and just making it creepy as opposed to shocking. And sales for both are somewhat disappointing. Does this mark the end of the horror genre? Not even close. Doom hits stores in 1993, and people are totally freaked. You probably turned off the lights. You probably sat there, and there were probably times where it kind of became a little overwhelming, especially because it was one of the first games of its type. I remember just things coming out of nowhere, and things are flying at you, and next thing you know, you're just like, oh my god, get me out of here. Doom opens the door for another genre. It certainly catapulted the first-person shooter into a major contender. They were the first to do it. That they were the ones who came along and said, OK, we're going to send you to, to hell. And hell is exactly where game players think they've gone next. Isle of the Dead is released. It's a first-person shooter where you play a hero stranded on a deserted island, infested with zombies. The game suffers a violent death. I would be very interested to see some of the horror masters getting involved in video games. Somebody like Stephen King or George Romero. Clive Barker did a game not long ago called Undying. Clive has a very sort of visual style. I could see his influence in games already, but I would love to see it more. But not all Doom wannabes die young. Clive Barker's Undying is later released by EA, and the critics soak it up. Meanwhile, FMVs pick out their plots. I almost think of it like books on tape. Like They were trying to do this multimedia thing, and, and nobody quite understood what multimedia was. I think the best one would be a Night Trap for the Sega CD, which has the distinction of being a bad direct-to-video B-horror movie as a game. 
and CD-ROM games that are FMV-driven, like Seventh Guest, are quietly buried. In 1996, one of the most popular games in the world is born, Resident Evil. The game circles around STARS, a special tactics rescue squad that's called upon to investigate a series of disappearances in the local mountains. The game has two parts, one that follows in the footsteps of Chris Redfield and the other, Jill Valentine. It falls out, gore fest, deliver the zombie movie perfectly. There's no holding back. It was kind of a new kind of thing to the PlayStation at that time. It kind of not gave just someone trying to tell a spooky story, but it gave a great action element to it. Resident Evil just takes the formula that I think Alone in the Dark established and executes it perfectly. It delivers the zombies, delivers everything about a horror movie. It puts you right there. For me, Resident Evil is where things really started to get scary because you not only had really good use of light and shadow and music, well, you had sort of different kinds of scares in that game. You had the zombies jumping up at you, and you're going, yeah, you know, but you also had a certain psychological terror. I was just incredibly frightened. I couldn't believe that a game really did it this well in terms of drawing me in and just scaring the life out of me. And one can't help but acknowledge the creepy similarities between Resident Evil and Alone in the Dark. I remember that a lot of people saying that Resident Evil was a lot like Alone in the Dark. We don't care. Capcom took a great idea and did a perfect execution, so hats off to them. You could say that about so many other things. I mean, how many games have now come along and ripped off Resident Evil? Resident Evil blows the competition away. The game came out and people sort of discovered it. You know, it's like you had a lot of groups of kids who were playing it with their friends and were scared out of their minds because they didn't know what to expect. And we have a new addition to the genre family survival horror. The survival horror tag always kind of makes me laugh because the objective in every game really is to survive. But we don't call them survival racing games or survival platform games. Survival horror is really more about the idea of the entire point of the game is getting through it and surviving it. I think survival horror is just a tag we've given horror games. Does anyone have a horror game that's not survival horror? I don't think so. And every good game needs a few scary sequels. Resident Evil 2 and 3 are released. Konami seizes the day and catches a lift from survival horror. Everyone was like, oh my god, Silent Hill, such a scary game. I, I played this and just, oh, I practically wet myself. You know, I was so afraid. The atmosphere and sound resemble that of a great horror flick with faint fog, following footsteps, and death-like nurses that send shivers down your spine. Silent Hill does a good job in much the same way, I think, for me, System Shock did, because it kind of puts you in this town. It's all foggy, it's slow paced, and I think Silent Hill delivers that same creep out factor. That's what spooks me is when you actually see these monsters and, you know, they look so lifelike, they're actually sort of swiping at you at the screen. It's the overall ambiance of the game the music, the sound, environment, all the key ingredients are here to make you really uh, frightened. There's a definite gore factor, but it's not quite the head lopping off, arm lopping off, blow my head off festival that, that Resident Evil can be. And more carbon copies are released, like 1994's D and 1997's Clock Tower. They had a good idea and a good concept. It could have been a lot more for what it was, and I think a lot of it was because of the gameplay. While the gameplay in Capcom's Resident Evil grabbed gamers everywhere, nobody can touch the success of that franchise. Not even Capcom's own Dino Crisis series. Very much Resident Evil, but with dinosaurs, which made it scary because dinosaurs move a lot quicker than zombies do. Parasite Eve wiggles onto the scene in 1998, the mitochondria mutating role-playing game, where the setting feels like Resident Evil, but the gameplay resembles Final Fantasy. It's scary in a way that, yes, there's a lot of shooting and killing the creatures and the mitochondria coming out of the body, fire coming out of the woman's eyes, and that being something that you have to um, defend yourself against and using weapons. The scariest moment for people who really like the creature features would be some of the cutscenes when the creatures start morphing and coming out at you. But scaring video game fans gets out of control with the release of a game that feels too real. By the late 1990s, game makers seemed to have found the formula for scaring people. 
if you watch a haunted house movie or any scary film, you know, you hear that thing kind of run through the background in stereo and kind of go, what the F was that? If you do that in a game, it's twice as effective. Everything that has to do with my childhood nightmares. If you're going to give them scales, Resident Evil, shocking. Silent Hill kind of walks the line between shocking and creepy, and we're trying to just be creepy. And technology gives developers the helping hand to be as creepy as they want. Freak. There will be uh, two features that will be uh, dramatically enhanced compared to the previous generation of console. The first one is, is for sure the sound. More and more people are equipped with a true surround system for their DVDs and movie experience. You have the graphic capabilities to create a place that has dark shadows in the corners where things could be hiding. Visual effects where things can pop out at you, but it's not just like in an old Atari game where the lip just kind of appears. You know, here you can have like a scary looking monster actually jump out at you from the shadow. By 2000, survival horror is taken to the next level with Resident Evil Code Veronica on the Dreamcast. While not the first survival horror game for a next-gen system, it becomes the most popular, and next-gen survival horror titles begin attacking stores everywhere. I think it was an extension of what had worked well in the past. It was a better, more improved version. Like Onimusha and Onimusha 2, the game is similar to Resident Evil, only with swords in a samurai setting. Onimusha was one of my favorite games, uh, again because of its Resident Evil-like mix of action and adventure. And PS2 and Xbox fans lose sleep over the nerve-wracking Silent Hill 2. Nintendo wants a piece of the action with Eternal Darkness on the GameCube. And you play all these sort of different characters at the same time on the brink of insanity, and you're battling sort of the same monster. Resident Evil is given a facelift and re-released on the Nintendo GameCube. They did it well. Gameplay is top notch. I mean, that's a phenomenal game. It looks beautiful. It's terrific. That is sort of revisiting the past, but it's doing it in an effective way that people like. Is all this gore and violence really a necessity? We need to bring to the player that fear through uh, different aspects, and violence is just a, a way to do it. Do I think gore is necessary? Well, Having never been bitten by a zombie myself, I don't know how much blood would squirt out of my arm. But I would imagine that if I was bitten by a zombie that there would be a certain amount of blood and gore. And so I think if you're going to make a game in which you're trying to be realistic, then gore is necessary. It can be used to embellish the storyline. It's always best when it's kind of like suggested in the background, not super in your face, maybe a flash of the gore. But you can go watch like a Friday the 13th film and you're like, oh, this is so over the top, this is so fake. And I think with games, it's the same thing. Uh, I think if you were to see a game come out there and truly have an accurate depiction of pain and suffering, I don't think people would buy that. I'll be one of those pro uh, free speech kind of guys. This is a personal thing. I don't think there's any element that should ever be taboo. Meanwhile, the genre starts to evolve with Devil May Cry, a game by Shinji Mikami, one of the creators of Resident Evil. The Thing is released in 2002 and proves that video games can instill fear just like horror films. Well, they wanted to do a horror action game that had a little bit different twist to it. So they took my film and they started it right when the movie ended. I think it's a great game. The environment that you're playing in and the backgrounds are just incredibly rendered. They really do look like the movie, and it's amazing to me. Oh, it's hard game. It's not an easy. It's not for wimps. Man, we're gonna die. And the future looks spooky as ever with Silent Hill 3, Onimusha 3, Resident Evil 0, Doom 3, and Devil May Cry 2, all slated to be released in 2003. And across the globe in Japan, one of their scary entries is picking up traction in the U.S., Fatal Frame. You know, you felt like you're actually in someone's, you know, Japanese mansion. One of the best compliments that I can give that game is that after playing it a couple times, I didn't want to play it late at night. I didn't want to play it before I was going to bed because I knew that I'd be lying in bed going, oh God, what was that noise? Uh, when I was playing the game and I was in a completely silent area, I kept hearing this weird humming noise. I thought, what is that? So I turned up the volume um, as far as I could, and you can actually hear all these voices arguing in the background. You know, little details like that I really enjoy. And don't worry, there are plenty more disturbing horror games waiting for you just around the corner. 
lot of people complain now that the survival horror genre has been so run into the ground because you see all these Resident Evil ripoffs and it's just the same thing. But look in movies though, it's every couple of years someone finds a way to do it differently. Someone finds a new approach. Survival horror has been done by movies for say 50 years. So they went really far into uh, what you could do with a jar. In video games, we need to still find the right way to put that into an interactive experience. People like anything that sort of gets at their emotions. As games sort of try and turn into a real art form, I think one of the things these games really have to do is they have to toy with your emotion. If you've enjoyed the Parasite Eve series, you're gonna really like what we have coming up in the next year. Technology is still improving to this day, but I think definitely, you know, games like Resident Evil and Silent Hill are showing that it's possible to really spook people inside the game environment. Here's what I'll tell you, it's, and, and this PR might kill me, but it's still kind of ambiguous. Alone in the Dark isn't dead, but it's gonna be overhauled, and you won't believe what we're gonna do. The thing that we're going after is real fear, like you would have experienced in your worst nightmares. Adrian. Oh, God. This might have just been hard. Oh. No, it's horrible. It's just a bad dream. You don't ever have to be afraid of anything. I'll always be there to protect you.